While researchers have long known that lobsters have been a key predator for sea urchins, a new study has revealed there's one bigger underwater animal that's been devouring these spiky creatures. So what species is also responsible for devouring sea urchins? And how has this changed our understanding of the ocean's food chain? The experiment was really set up to look at lobsters feeding because uh, we've done tethering experiments in the past um, and that's where you physically restrain an urchin from going back into its protective crevice, right? So basically putting it on a platter for a predator to come and eat. Um, and we thought that previous experiments might have missed lobster feeding because we got really low rates of um, lobster predation on tethered urchins. <clears throat> and we thought that might be, you know, maybe the lobsters weren't home that day. Maybe they were having a sick day. Like heaps of things could have contributed to that. So we thought, all right, if we tether them directly at a lobster den, we're going to get higher rates of lobster feeding. Um, but that's not what we found. Crested horn sharks and PJs, uh, Port Jackson sharks, came in and smashed 45% of the urchins, whereas um, lobsters took only 4%. So that lined up with our previous hypotheses, but um, way stronger feeding response from sharks than we'd expected. With climate change, you know, Centra Stephanus Rogers eye, the, the really conspicuous black spiny urchin that we see around, um, has range extended with warming waters down to Tasmania um, because and Victoria because Centro doesn't like um, the heat, so it's it's going to colder regions. So in those new places, it's causing lots of problems. They're really generalist omnivores and not these um, you know specialized kelp feeders that everyone's kind of assumed that they were. Um, and surprisingly. You know, only two people um, in Australia have gone through the gut contents of these things, which I found really amazing. Um, and when we looked in the guts, you know, we found all sorts of things, not just seaweed. So if they're in an environment <clears throat> and there's seaweed, it's likely that they'll eat it. But, you know, seaweed also faces all these other cumulative stressors um, and urchins are certainly one of those. In New South Wales, it sort of seems to be a business as usual, um, but the jury's still out. Um, there, you know, there's reports of increased urchin density to the south, um, which, you know, that, that's mostly anecdotal. And fisheries do survey this stuff. Um, and it seems to be about 2 to 5% increase of kelp in some places, 2 to 5% decrease. Um, but, you know, in that statistic, um, I, I'm always one to not tell divers and, and conservationists that they're not seeing what they're seeing. Um, you know, 2 to 5% could be a really large area. and if I saw that as a diver, I'd be concerned um, too, and I'd, I'd want to do something about it. One of the main ways that people suggest we can control urchins is through sanctuary zones. And that's sort of where my research question started because down in Jervis Bay, um, somewhere that I work pretty regularly, um, we've got these really beautiful, well-managed sanctuary zones that are full of predators of all different types. Um, and in those places, we often find actually more urchin barrens in the sanctuary than outside. And that's where I started going, hang on, so are the predators eating the urchins? Because we know the predators are in there. Um, we know that sanctuary zones are really good. Are they a tool um, to remove urchins and reduce urchin barrens in New South Wales? I mean, that's a, another really interesting question that I hope to investigate in the future. If you make a sanctuary that has Southern rock lobsters in it, they stay in one place and they, they do the job of eating urchins, whereas um, it seems that Sagemariosis varroi, the eastern rock lobster, um, even if you have a really good sanctuary, it'll take off for half of the year. And, and given that that's its life cycle, and you know that's its sort of um, what it does through its ontogeny, um, you know it's not that surprising to see that it it can eat urchins and it does, but it seems to be a lot more opportunistic than being this key predator that had this you know really strong controlling effect on urchins that we're expecting. We've known since 1976, a paper by McLaughlin and O'Gower, I believe, who are probably getting a bit long in the tooth now, but they reported, you know, <clears throat> decades ago that Port Jackson sharks had Centristephanus spines in their guts. Um, I wasn't, you know, willing to, to, to di dissect any Port Jackson sharks for, um, for this uh, experiment, but they did it way back, uh, way back then. And also in 2020, um, I did some pilot studies where we had Port Jacksons coming in and, um, you know, eating urchins. I guess until this experiment, we didn't know how keen they would be to do it. And 
I suggest that some of that keenness comes from the fact that we've, you know, put them on a platter. And, um, you know, I, I, I suggest that they're probably opportunistically doing this. But, you know, on the other hand, divers, <clears throat> divers for some time have reported um, PJs and crested horn sharks having like purple lipstick. Um, and it's been suggested, you know, people were like, oh, maybe that's from eating urchins. And in my dissections of predators, um, you tend to find urchin dye from Centra Stephens has a really strong purple dye, um, which can indicate the presence of that food, you know, in predator stomach. So given that we now find them eating tethered urchins, we know they've got this purple lipstick and we know it's in their guts. It's pretty likely that they've been eating urchins, you know, this whole time to some extent. It's been suggested that these species of sharks might have seen some declines, um, you know, due to trawling or, um, you know, shark nets and stuff. But, but really, the empirical evidence is that um, they have a really high survival survival rate. So, like, 96% um, is the survival rate for sharks, this kind of shark caught in nets. So, it doesn't really seem like, you know, that's a limiting factor to their populations. But, but certainly, you know, um, if we can bolster their populations, it would be a good thing to do. They just don't just um, don't seem to be under any really great threat from fishing the way these other predators um, are and have been. I'm always really clear when I talk about this stuff and, and give presentations and that to end on a note of, you know, this does not mean that we've found a missing keystone predator, which I think a lot of media organizations and groups are keen to jump on and sort of publicize. Um, that's really not the case because these things have been abundant in the long term. Um, given that they eat urchins, they've likely been doing it um, all along. But, you know, their numbers are, are, are lower than other predators like snapper and lobsters. Um, and also, they, they too migrate seasonally. So if there is um, a, a really strong response for these things controlling urchins, it would be a seasonal pulse event and probably not something that you could rely on solely um, to you know protect kelp forests and given that they've been so ubiquitous in the past and we still find them in really big numbers you know um, it doesn't explain why kelp forests have been declining so to me the most parsimonious answer while I'm really interested in predators and I am still looking for that key predator which might be able to control urchins you know the elephant in the room is really climate change um, that's likely stripping our kelp forests and causing massive declines. There's still plenty of work to be done here um, and that'll set the scene for other people to come along and hopefully um, get some more answers. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and subscribe and let us know in the comments what topics you'd like us to cover in the future.